we spoke about that earlier, David. If people are divided from religion, from race, they're easier to control. The masses are easier to control because everybody's fighting and arguing whose beliefs yeah. are right. And for me personally, we're all equal. We all deserve a chance. And to set limits on yourself, you're crazy because everything is limitless. You're the one who can control and take whatever you want to do out of life. When you, when you started your journey, David, obviously you went through the Terry Wogan show, which was massive for you because you came on that show and you spoke out how you believed in and the things that you've seen and the things you were educating yourself with because you always say they ridiculed you, which I believe was... It's sad when you watch that interview. Um, when you were going on that, did you know that that was going to be the outcome? Yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, people, people, people said to me, didn't you know that would happen if you said this and said that? And I thought, I said, well, do you know I'd work that out? Mm -hmm. But you say it anyway. I, I, but, but you see, th there's a lot of background um, with that. Because I was, um, I was going through my life. I, I, I left um, uh, school at 15. I didn't take a major exam because I went to be a professional footballer with Coventry and, and, and others. And then um, my career ended with rheumatoid arthritis. I played a, a whole year of league football with rheumatoid arthritis. That's a whole story in, in itself. Uh, but what that did is it developed it de developed in you because all these things are within us and experience brings them out. And if you don't have experience, often they don't come out. So um, I have this phrase, um, life tends to give us our greatest gifts brilliantly disguised as our worst nightmares. Mm -hmm. Because often our worst nightmare will, will, will bring things out of us that wouldn't otherwise happen. This is why if you, if you bring your kids up and you protect them from everything, you're doing them no favors because you're, you're not developing strong people who will be able to deal with life. You're developing people uh, who um, are always looking to be um, protected. And, and, and look, look at what we have now. And, and once you have a generation or, or you have a population that wants to be protected and perceives itself all the time as being a victim, where does the power, uh, point of power move? It moves to authority because people look to authority to protect them from what they fear or what they feel victimized by. So what we have, we've been developing is a population of, uh, uh, of, of emotionally weak people who perceive themselves in terms of victims. When you have challenges in life and you meet them, um, it brings something out of you. So for instance, when um, my... Uh, my arthritis came and I didn't know what, what else am I going to do at that time. I wanted to be a footballer. I wanted to be a footballer since I was a kid. And now my joints are swelling up and, and, and they're telling me I'm going to have to pack it in. And I thought, I'm not packing it in. I, I, I want to give it a go. So I, I, I went to a club called Hereford United that was a league club then. And um, I, I played the whole season with rheumatoid arthritis. Every morning when we were training, uh, and warming up for training on cold English mornings, I was in agony. And, and, and I would be limping and what have you, and the players would say, oh, what's wrong now, Ike? And I, 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 I would give a different excuse, oh, I've got a bit of a pull, oh, I think I've got a bit of a blister. But actually it was the same thing all the time. Uh, and, and I played the season out, and eventually it got so bad that I couldn't carry on. But it brought something out of me, this, this determination not, not to give up and not to give in. And then I, um, I, I decided, because when I was a kid, I, I was always reading newspapers and I uh, was very interested in journalism. So I, I became a journalist and long story short, I eventually became uh, a television presenter. You were very well known back then? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was, I was a national television presenter in those days. Um, which we, uh, and when I look at my life now, you see, and, and what I'm doing, my life before, which appeared to be a series of random events... Same with you. You've had your challenges yeah. in life. What has it done? It's made you the person you are. You wouldn't be the person you are now without them. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, I regret that. I regret that. Well, the, 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 the thing to regret is if you don't learn from the experience. That's the regret. But learning from the experience, well, you just had a gift. What are you regretting for? And um, so um, I, um, I went to, uh, into journalism because I, I, I was very interested in that. And I eventually became this television presenter. And when you look at my life, as I was saying, um, all the different elements of it, including going into journalism and seeing the media for what it is, going into politics with the Green Party and seeing politics for what it is, well, I, I didn't know at the time, but they were all giving me very, very um, important uh, understandings that will be useful later on. 
And then what happened is, yes, I mean, this is a kind of bizarre story, but it happened. I uh, was uh, I was in the Green Party, uh, and, and I and I was still working for the BBC as a television presenter, and both were leaving me completely cold. Um, you know, the, uh, the, 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 B, the BBC, um, it, it, it's, it's not a great organization to work for if you care about uh, the, the truth and you care about, um, you know, more than the official version of everything. And uh, I also was looking at the, at the Green Party politics from the inside and seeing that it was just like every other party. And so I was, uh, what do I do with my life now? Because I, I, I can't go on with either of these. And what happened was a very strange thing happened because in the um, early um, part of what would it be, um, 1989, I started having this feeling that when I was in a room alone, I wasn't alone. And it's like this, it's like this, there was an atmosphere there. This, there's something there. And through 1989, this, this got more and more and more powerful to the point where in early 1990, I was working for the BBC and I was, I was staying at a hotel called the Kensington Hilton, just down from the BBC uh, uh, headquarters. And I'm sitting on the side of the bed and in, in this apparently empty room and, and there, there was such a sense of a presence there that I said into the room, you know, if there's something there, would you please contact me because you'll drive me up the wall. Few... Um, Days later, um, I'm on the seafront with my son Gareth, little boy then, in Ride, uh, where I live on the Isle of Wight. And um, I, 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 I go into this newsagent shop where uh, Gaz was looking at one of the books. And I said to him, come on, Gaz, we'll go and get some lunch in the town. And, and as I said it, it was like the atmosphere changed, like the energetic field around me changed. And all I heard, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a voice, it was a very strong thought form. It said, go and look at the books on the far side. And I'm standing there thinking, you know. Do not shut yourself. Yeah. <laughs> what, no, basically, what the? And so I start walking across to the books in, in, a, in a daze, thinking, what is happening? And I knew this bookshop. The books it sold were for, you know, the tourists that come to the Isle of Wight. They were basically Mills and Boone and, and, and you know, perfectly formed English roses and having relationships with perfectly formed, you know, uniformed soldiers and all this stuff. So I'm thinking, what am I going over here for? But right in the middle of these books was one called Mind to Mind by a woman called Betty Shine. A, a, a picture was on the front. It was different to the other. So I picked it up and I turned it over and I read the blurb. And she was a psychic. Uh, an English psychic, and uh, she uh, was telling her life story. So I bought the book, read it in 24 hours, found it very interesting, contacted her, um, because I wanted to go and see if she would pick up what the hell was happening around me for the last year. And um, so I went, I told her nothing. What I told her was, because she did this hands-on healing as well, which is just an exchange of energy. You know, it's not mumbo-jumbo, it's an exchange of energy. Ricky. Yes, it's just an exchange of energy. That's all it is. But anyway, um, I told her that because I said, I've got arthritis. Maybe it will help because I didn't want to give anything away what was happening to me. So I'm sitting on this bench, um, this medical type bench in her front room, and, you know, she's chatting away and she's doing the whole, you know, hands on healing just next to my left knee. And suddenly the atmosphere changed again. And um, I felt like a spider's web on my face. Now, what hit me was in her book, she said, when other levels of reality are trying to lock into you, you sometimes feel like a spider's web on your face. Well, I know what that, what, that, that was now. It's electromagnetic energy. You know, you know when you, 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 you're in a, a, a crowd, a football crowd with, of, of great emotional excitement, you, you feel like a charge of energy. Mm -hmm. The hair stands yeah, up yeah, on yeah, your yeah. neck, you know. That's electromagnetic. They're electromagnetic fields. So that's what I was feeling. But it did feel like a spider's web on my face. And I said nothing to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to Betty, but I'm thinking, what the hell? And then about 10 or 15 seconds later, um, she reels her head back and she said, my God, this is powerful. I've got to close my eyes for this one. And my bums for going further down the, <laughs> what have you got yourself into here, Ike? <laughs> and she starts telling me in March 1990, 
that I'm going to go out on a world stage and reveal great secrets. I would face enormous opposition, but they, whatever that is, would always be there to protect me. And that there, there was a, a shadow over the world that, and there was a story that needed to be told that humanity was, gonna, was going to go through a phase of waking up and coming out of basically its coma, um, which is programming, and that I was going to go out and do that. Uh, one man cannot change the world, but one man can communicate the message that can change the world was one of the things she said. And I'm sitting there. I'm a television presenter for the BBC. I'm a national spokesman for the Green Party. Uh, and I'm thinking, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, and so I then leave, 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 leave her and get on a train. Uh, she lived near Hassex in Sussex, and, 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 um, or in Hassex, actually. And, and then I, I drove up. Or, or, or went up in the train to present a television program. But from that moment on, what, one of the things that was said, that, that she said, because she said, the first thing she said, she had no idea about this interaction in the Kensington Hilton. She's saying that they're telling me they know you, you wanted them to contact you, but the time wasn't right. And you, you, you know, now you've been brought here to be contacted. And they said, uh, they're saying that you're going to be led to knowledge and... At other times, knowledge will be put into your mind. Oh, all right. Okay. What? Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, after that... See, at that time, David, did you think she was maybe crazy because you didn't no. understand that? Or would you just an open book? Because when you speak out about stuff like that, people go, well, he's maybe crazy. But yeah. again, it's judging people and everybody's in their own different paths. Yeah. I mean, wh what I've been like, uh, mate, all my life is um, I've never dismissed things that... Um, I can't know absolutely are not true. Um, I, 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 I have this policy, I put things on the back burner and I see what comes. And if more information comes to support it, more information comes to support it, there comes a point where there's so much information supporting that that it crosses the line and you, know, you start to say, okay, I accept this is what's happening. But I don't just dismiss things mm. and never have on the basis that they're different just been the way I've always been. Was that the start of your journey then, going to this woman and everything, like it, awakening, a spiritual yes, awakening? Yeah, yes, yeah, it was. And, and um, you know, w one of, the, um, one of the, the things was that, it, you know, it, it was going to be tough. Uh, and, and so when I left that, um, left her house and got on with my life, very, very quickly synchronicity coincidences started to occur where i'd i'd meet people come across information come across books come across documents whatever that were starting to like hand me puzzle pieces and i started to realize as it built up and it built up and it built up that actually the world was not like i thought it was well not like i thought it was i didn't really have that, a, a, a view on that i think you just brainwashed it and didn't yeah, really understand I, 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 I never did believe that politicians around the world i always felt there was something else but you didn't even you didn't know what it was now i was beginning to understand what question it was everything. And how it works yeah and another thing that happened is that i would get uh just a knowing that this is how i think this is what's going on here and then what would follow would be names dates places hard factual information that would support that view um which kind of connects with we will put knowledge into his mind and this has gone on now for 30 years and it's gone through different different phases of information and uh it's taken me down a an extraordinary uh road of uncovering the world as it is behind the facade of what we're told it is and of course it's taken me into realms of enormous ridicule and enormous abuse but we come back to the greatest gift uh, often that you are ever given is your worst nightmare or what appears to be so if we go back to the wogan show because what happened eventually is i went on the wogan show and talked about what was happening to me and at that time i was right in that period of the wogan show it was a period of about three months I was going through an enormous transformation of that you didn't perception understand. that I didn't understand. No, because this is what happened, just very, very, very briefly, um, is that I, 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 
suddenly got this feeling I, I needed to go to Peru. I didn't know why. I'd never been there. I, I watched them play in the World Cup uh, a few times, but I didn't know anything about it. And long story short, I ended up in Peru and a, no, a, a series of enormously uh, uh, amazing things happened to me. And it culminated at a place called Siustani, which is near a place called Puno, near Lake Titicaca, highest navigable lake in the world, they say, about 13,000 feet. And, and I ended up, in a series of synchronicities again, at this so-called Inca site um, called Siustani, which is all Inca ruins on a hill, and there's a, a lake and mountains right out in the middle of nowhere. And... I, I went and I, I looked around it and then I'd, I'd hired this taxi and this uh, guide who came with me and, and we're driving away from Siustani um, and I'm just um, daydreaming, which I do all the time, daydreaming out the window, sort of mind wandering and I'm looking at this hill as we're coming towards it and as I looked at this hill, all I could hear in my head was come to me, come to me, come to me. You know, and I'm thinking, you know, I, I was introducing I was introducing the snooker uh, not long ago, actually. And now this freaking hill's talking to me. You know? <laughs> it's like, you know, it's what's going on? <laughs> Steve Davis, Jimmy White, all is forgiven. <laughs> and so I, t I got, asked the guy to stop. I said, I won't be a minute. I'm going up that hill. And I walked up the hill. And I didn't know where I was going or why. And... Um, there's, there's this, all these kind of stones. It's kind of a kind of circle like of stones, and I, I walked into the middle, and it's beautiful. And there's not a cloud in the sky. It's a, a pure blue Peruvian sky, piercing sun, red nose to prove it. And I stood there, and what happened to me then happened to me. I cover this bit in the news shop in Ride, where I'm standing there, and suddenly I feel like my feet are being pulled to the ground and like, like magnetically. And I'm feeling like a drill in the top of my head. And the atmosphere changed again. Only this was much more powerful than the new shop. And I heard this, again, very strong thought form go through my mind, which said, um, first of all, they'll be talking about this 100 years from now. What? And then which seemed absolutely crazy given the sky and the sun and the, it will be over when you feel the rain, right? And then what happened is um, my arms went out like that without me making any decision to, 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 to do that. And then this energy got more and more powerful. And in the end, my body's shaking. And, and what um, was happening it's like when you're driving a car and you can't remember the last mile your subconscious has been driving the car thank goodness um, I, I kept coming back to some kind of consciousness and then going it, it, back somewhere else and as I came back to consciousness at one point my conscious mind I noticed that over the far distant mountains there was a light gray mist and I'm watching it and it's getting darker and it's getting darker faster and I think it's freaking raining. And then over not very long, the whole thing took maybe, I don't know, an hour, 45 minutes an hour. This storm came out of the, I mean, you couldn't make it up. If you, if you, put, if you put this on a, on, on a movie, they'd say, oh, come on. It happened. This, this storm is coming towards me. And you know whether people talk about a, a front. Yeah. Well, this is a front. It's a straight bloody line. I'm looking up. It's, it's, it's literally out of some crazy movie. And this, and it's stair rod rain. It's not just raining, it's stair rod rain. And it's coming towards me. And I'm standing there and, and I'm seeing this wall of water coming towards me. It's like something out of bloody Moses. <laughs> the freaking Red Sea. And, 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 he, he, and by this time, my body's shaking like crazy with this energy coming through me. And then the water hit me. I mean, I'm immediately drenched because it's stair rod rain. And bang, the energy stopped. And I staggered forward like Bambi because my legs were gone. And uh, there, were en there was energy pouring out my feet and pouring out my hands. And it's still pouring out of uh, my feet. I couldn't sleep that night uh, because of it. Um, and something changed. Um, 
I, 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 you, you, if you, people could imagine you lived your life in a bubble, um, literally a bubble of information, a bubble of perception, and someone's come along without any warning and popped the bloody thing. <laughs> and suddenly everything that was outside the bubble was pouring in. So my mind is absolutely awash with information, concepts, insights. What the hell's going on? That, you know, it was just a, a chaotic mass of, of, of information and thought and everything. And in that period, it lasted about three months. If you'd have asked me my name, I'd have checked. And that, it was in that period, in my turquoise shell suit, that I went on to um, the, um, the Wogan show. And, and everything that, 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 that happened. Um, and after about three months, after all the ridicule and all the newspapers and all that stuff, basically, you, you know when you, you, you press too many keys on a computer and the computer freezes, mm -hmm. says, I can't process this. Well, that was me. There was so much information pouring into my uh, uh, conscious mind as a result of that experience in Peru. I, I couldn't process it. I mean, you basically froze. What happened after three months is it unfroze. And now I'm, I'm the old David again, but I ain't. Just more. I'm seeing the world in a completely different way. I'm seeing, I'm, uh, as, they, as they say when you read a newspaper, uh, the, the truth is in the white bits, not the words, the bits in between, you know. You, you, and, and so I, I was seeing things and connections that I... Um, couldn't see before did you ever question yourself there David and think am I losing my mind do I need to go and get help or did you just feel right for you did it well did you understand that a bit more well it felt right to me I'm say I completely understood it then um it felt right to me and and I I, I did I did what I always do like I've just mentioned earlier I thought okay I'm going with this and we're going to see where it's going to go um and I didn't know where it was going but I'm going to go with this and see where it goes um, and people were coming up to me after that, you know, shh, unfreezing. And they were saying, I thought, they thought you'd gone mad. You're the same Dave we used to know. But I wasn't. I, I appeared to be, but I wasn't. I was seeing the world in a completely different way. And, of course, in, in a world which is overwhelmingly programmed to see the world in a certain way, it's what happens through the education system and the media and peer pressure. It's very, very narrow band of sense of the possible, sense of what is. When you start talking about things that are different to that, then immediately the reaction is you're crazy or you're dangerous, or in my case, um, you're both. But <laughs> what followed, what followed, of course, was mass ridicule as a well, the Wogan show. And people said, you know, it must have been horrible. Well, it was, but it was the greatest gift I ever have been given because it set me free of the prison that most people live in, which is the fear of what other people think. Mm -hmm. When you literally can't walk down the street without being laughed at, I mean, I lived my life for a long time after that to the sound of distant or even close laughter. Um, going into a pub, forget it. Um, and uh, so you either go under and you disappear. But the majority of people do. Yeah, or you come out like steel honed in the fire and you let go of this, this, this prison, this ball and chain that most of the population of the world live in, the fear of what other people think. Most people, the vast majority of people, because of this fear, are not living their truth. They're not living their life. They're not living their uniqueness they're living what they think is acceptable to other people's version of what they should be. So they, they go through mental gymnastics before saying things, e even more today with political correctness and all this bollocks. Um, what can I say? So they, they won't say I'm this, I'm that, or, or what can I say and how can I say it so they won't think I'm mad. Now, when the world appears, it wasn't the world, there were others that saw through it, but certainly appeared to be the world and was the vast majority are ridiculing you mercilessly 
I mean, someone only had to say my name uh, in, in, a, in a comedy uh, thing. I remember David Frost just mentioned my name in a Royal Variety performance. The bloody audience laughed. No, you, jo you, no would, joke necessary. How did that affect you and your family? Did you ever think that moving away, or did you think to yourself, I can't handle this? Were you ever suicidal or anything, David? No, absolutely uh, no. Um, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm a stubborn bugger, me. Mm -hmm. And, and the, more, the more you tell me what I can't say, the more I'll say it. The more you tell me what I can't do, I'll do it. And, uh, uh, um, uh, but there was, there was something, obviously you've got confusion. What the hell is happening to me? What's happening? But there's a, there was a core beyond that, that somehow just knew this was going to be okay. And it was leading somewhere and just some knowing that you can't really explain. And I'll, get, I'll, tell, I'll tell you a story, a true story. I'm, I'm sitting on, I'm sitting in the seat on the Wogan show and he's talking to me. And the audience are laughing. And, and David Icke, the experiencer, experience rather, not the experiencer, the experience, was, was dying. But something, something beyond that was saying to me, as it was happening, this is leading somewhere. It's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. It's going to okay, be okay. And that, 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 wherever that was coming from, that kind of kept me going through all this period of ridicule. And, you know, I didn't know at that point, of course, some of the things that I was going to be talking about. I didn't know what was coming and what was going to be uncovering and all that stuff. Some of the things on that show, David, you, you, you covered because you went back on the Wogan show, which you did apologise for. It came through, yeah. some of the stuff. So... Again, that's shown that you stood up for what you believed in. It did come true.